Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to another edition of Agency Life. My name is Cloda Higgins and I work with the Grow It Group. And brace yourselves today because we have an incredible guest. I'm delighted that she is able to come on to the podcast. Um, so we could be here a while, but we have so much information to share with you. Kathleen Booth from Impact, Vice President of Marketing. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Awesome. Now, you have one hell of a story. <laughs> waste delivery and waste management, consulting and flying all around all over the world. One day you sat down. Where were you in the world that you sat down and went, you know what? I want to open an agency. Tell me how that started. Oh, my God. It's such a crazy story, and I, maybe it was a midlife crisis. I have no idea. Um, but I, yeah, my the first part of my career, I was did something so different than what I do now. I was a consultant, did a lot of work for the World Bank and the U.S. Agency for International Development, specifically on privatization of water and wastewater services in developing countries. So wow. it, was, it was great. I was in my twenties. I got to travel to 54 countries, mostly in the developing world, which I actually, I loved. Um, but it's not the best job if you want to settle down and start a family. Right. <laughs> um, and also, I mean, you're talking, I, th I think when I started to get frustrated was I would work on these projects, like the, the one that really stands out in my head was working on trying to introduce private management in the water services in Ghana, like across the whole country. No. And it's such a beautiful country and they, you know, the cost of not having good water is so high for a lot of reasons and you get really invested in the work, but it's so complex to do those projects. That one took 10 years to get done. Wow. And I, I got kind of burnt out on the travel, but also, you know, I, I wanted to do something where I could more quickly see the fruits of my labors. Right. And um, I felt marketing, I, I had studied marketing. I got my MBA in marketing. And so it kind of brought me back to this because it's another way to help and, and, like improve the world one company yeah. at a time, but yeah. bigger results which right. is really, and less travel. Yes. Less travel and less uh, political bureaucracy. I would imagine yeah. <laughs> what oh, you yeah. were dealing with in the past. Yeah. So you, you sat down with your husband to, to talk about the agency together. Yeah. You know, we, it was such a crazy circumstance because we started the agency basically when we got married Right. Um, oh and oh, really? Did you move into a new house as well while you were at it? <laughs> well, pretty much. I mean, it was yeah. When I when I do things, I go big, I guess. Um, so we started the company, and initially, we were not a traditional marketing agency. We were we sold promotional products because he had come from another company that did that. Yeah. So people call it promo products or swag or tchotchkes or what have you, branded stuff. And um, that was in 2006. And then in 2008, nine, when the economy crashed, we started doing inbound marketing, not knowing that that's what it was called, right. but we blogged and we did social media for ourselves and it started to work and people began asking us to help them with it. And that's kind of how our, the agency that I wound up really running for a long time was, was born. Right. And so the main amount of work that you were doing like that for, so that was about, it ended up being what about 14, 13, 14 years. Am I approximately? I think in total, it was 11 years that right, we Right. 11 years. Okay. Yeah. The bulk of that work somehow led you through, you said you were doing inbound, but all of a sudden you kind of realized what was the juncture that that HubSpot collided with your uh, natural <laughs> inbound activities? Yeah, so we started doing inbound for ourselves without HubSpot in 2008. And then we, I think we became HubSpot partners and purchased it for ourselves in 2011. Right. Um, and it was a game changer. I mean, really, we, to the end of the company, we always still continue to sell promotional products, but that was a smaller piece of our business. It, we really became a true inbound marketing agency and, and flipped the model completely on its head. Yeah. And tell us about that journey. It grew from obviously a small group. How, how did that grow and, and how was the transition for you growing in that business? Yeah, it's such a different business than the one we had started in. Um, you know, with promotional products, you can order 10 mugs with your logo on it, or you can order yeah. 10,000 mugs with your logo on it. And, and the level of effort that goes into producing that kind of an order is the same, regardless of quantity. So Right. It's a different, very different business model in terms of how you need to staff your company. Got it. Um, whereas, you know, as anyone listening, I'm sure knows with, with inbound marketing services, with a, with a marketing agency, 
your scalability is so incredibly dependent upon your ability to add manpower. Mm. And so it was an interesting shift. We added a lot of people over the next several years as we grew that agency. I think at our largest, we were 13 people. So we were never huge. Yeah, um, still though, reasonable size for, for an inbound agency. Yeah, and we had kind of reached a point where I remember at that 13 person mark uh, thinking, gosh, we're at that stage where I either need to like really commit to growing this and like get over the hump and get much bigger, or I need to reevaluate the model and maybe even shrink it and, mm -hmm. and make it smaller. That was like a funny time that, yeah. that 11 to 13 people mark. <laughs> yes, an interesting time. You you went through um, some challenges through that. And um, we, we, you know, something I love about you, you're so open about when, you know, helping people through this, because if we can share our stories, we can maybe um, reach out to an agency owner out there who's got these little bugs in their head going, mm, I think something's going wrong. So one of the things you mentioned was which you really had a challenge with was uh, financial planning. And then the other one that was firing fast, which you kind of indicated that the two of those were linked. Can you elaborate more on what that was about? Yeah, I mean, I am, um, what I really learned through that whole experience is that being an, an entrepreneur and a business owner can be incredibly lonely. Um, Right. I was lucky because my husband was my business partner and somehow we stayed married through the 11 years of doing that together. Um, but, and so I did have him to share it with, but, but when things are not going well, it's, it's very lonely and no business owner likes to admit that things are not going well. So you tend, especially in marketing, we're so good at making everything sound amazing. <laughs> so we yeah, tend to good. gloss over these things. And I, and I remember at the time people saying things like, you guys sound like you're crushing it. You're winning all these awards. And, and I always used to respond, I was like, well, remember, I am a marketer. Right. Um, you know, and there were definitely good things that happened, but the two, as you mentioned, the two things that I think we really struggled with, I personally really struggled with. Yes. Yeah. One is that I am just terrible with the financial planning side of owning a business. And right. if I could go back and do it all over again, I would have put together some kind of an advisory board with yeah. somebody on it who was really good at the finances and could hold me accountable and, and tell me no when I needed to hear no. Um, right. So, you know, one of our biggest challenges was when we did go through that recession um, in 2008, 2009, we, we took on a lot of debt to get us through it. And so we leveraged our home equity line of credit um, mm -hmm. at that point and, yeah. and credit cards and things like that. And so that, you know, I look back at that and the real problem that we set ourselves up for was that servicing that debt became so expensive that I almost felt like we were never going to get out from under it. Um, and, you know, I think that's why I say when I, when I think about the size of the agency, at some point it might've made sense for me to actually contract and get smaller right. so that I could be profitable even at a smaller level and yeah. not have to take on the debt that I did. Um, so that was, that was one thing. I, I think that we, we paid the price for having taken that debt on for many years after we did it. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the firing fast thing, it's, it's tough. Like I loved the people that worked for me. Yeah. I really did. Um, and, and we were a small team. I got to know them all really well as people. I had some people that were just amazing rock stars, you know, just phenomenal. I had other people who underperformed, but they were all great people. And, yeah. you know, I did, I, I, I'm, I'm okay with firing people. Um, and I, I think I can do it in a compassionate way, but I guess my optimistic nature leads me to always want to believe that we can work through these performance issues and like, I can coach somebody through it and get them to the point where they need to be. Yeah. On the services side that hurt us, I think, because in some cases I kept people on too long who were underperforming more than I thought with respect to client facing things. And, and our, it, it hurt our client retention. Right. Yeah. And then the, but the biggest issue I had was on the sales side over, over the years of our company, we had several different people in sales roles and it's such a hard role to hire for. Right. And yes, it is. Yeah, it sure yeah. is. And then, you know, I, I can definitely say that more than once I kept an underperforming salesperson on longer than I should have. And the really bad thing about that is if you don't have somebody else like stepping in to keep the, the pipeline full, 
it, it, it really can dramatically hurt you. And that's, yeah. I think, in the very end, when we decided to exit the company, it, that was one of the big precipitators was that our sales pipeline had dried up considerably. Right. Um, and I let, I let a sales, an underperforming sales role continue for longer than I should have. Yeah, you're not, definitely not alone there, Kathleen. I've seen that happen over and over again. First of all, most agency owners are doing the sales themselves. And by the time they get a person in, they pretty much never want to do that sales role again. Yes. Hell or, come hell or high water, right? So what uh, happens is absolutely. <laughs> they're like, oh, phew, thank God, somebody's going to do the sales. And this like little switch in their head goes off. Oh, great. I never have to do that again. And so when the prospect of a salesperson not performing, the last thing they're thinking of is getting rid of them. They'll prop and do and coach and sticky tape over it and go out and sales calls with them like yeah. they'll do anything for, instead of that pipeline coming right back at them and it is it a, a very expensive situation to be in so i think if anyone's out there and i i always encourage agency owners as soon as you can get to a point where you can get a salesperson in that's great but take your time to hire the right person and yeah. then Always remember that they've got a series of things to do. And if they're not doing them, that if that job role could come back to you. It's like a hot potato. <laughs> the hot potato could come back, but that's okay because you're going to give it to somebody else. So um, really good, good insight from you there on, on, on how that worked. You, you also mentioned one of the things that you were doing in the, in, or maybe it's something that you were doing in Impact, but something now that is a really big thing is you don't have to be reliant on um, ex experts that you need in your business to be living locally. Was that something you embraced in Quintain at first, or is it something you're experiencing on, uh, in the new side? Yeah, I mean, we uh, in the early years of Quintain, everyone we hired was local, and we were based in Annapolis, Maryland, where I still live to this day. Yeah, and it's a small market. Um, right. You know, we we have Baltimore and Washington D.C. nearby, and most of the really good marketing talent goes to those cities because the, the ability to pay more is there, et cetera, bigger agencies, mm -hmm. sexier jobs and clients, et cetera. Um, so we were hiring locally, but I really, it, that became a real barrier. I was not able to find the quality of people I needed. And I, I'll never forget, I went to, I was part of an executive networking group and I went to a talk by someone who had run several very large companies and exited them. Um, and he, the focus of his talk was about why you should embrace remote uh, leadership teams in this case, but he talked about having like CFOs and CEOs who are remote. And basically what he said was, you know, you want to hire the best people no matter where they are. And you can, and he said remote works if somebody already know, has done the job well once. You okay. can't, remote doesn't work if you hire somebody who needs to be trained to do the, to do the job well, Got but it. if they've already done the job well once, if they have that track record, there's no reason you can't hire remotely and have it work phenomenally. And so I went to that talk, I came back and I was like, my eyes are opened. I'm going after the best people. And, and we changed our hiring strategy. And instantly I found, that's when I found so many amazing people. Like some, some of those people still work with me to this day. They came over to impact and they're just some of the smartest, best performers. I had some great local people too who, who are right. still with me. I want to make sure I say that in case they're listening. Of course. <laughs> um, but it, it really was a game changer and it, yeah. it had a dramatic impact on our success with clients, the quality of work we did, and really did not hurt our culture or, or our performance at all. And, and so when we moved to Impact, at the time, um, Impact had... I would say maybe 15 to 20% of its workforce was remote. Yeah. Now we joined impact in June of 2017. Since that time, I think at that point there were 35 employees here and now we're getting close to 70 and now about 60% plus of our employees are remote because really we have the same philosophy. Like for most positions, we just want the best people and yeah you know, those people tend to be able to perform well in remote circumstances. Incredible. So great advice there. If they're doing well on their own in an office or in remotely, if they're, if they're competent and standalone at that senior advanced executive um, or experience, they could be young, but yeah. they're super experienced, um, remote can work. That's fantastic. Now, Kathleen, you've just hit on it there. The whole world is just, agency world is just buzzing right now. 
mergers and acquisitions are just the hottest thing. And as you know, I work with Avidly and we're lucky enough to go behind the scenes when many of these conversations are happening in the very beginning. Um, in fact, uh, one of my sort of part-time jobs is doing a bit of shopping, you know, going, mm -hmm. <laughs> looking on the partner directory and sort of checking things out, see who's doing what. Um, it's, uh, I don't do retail anymore. This is my new uh, <laughs> shopping, shopping for companies. I, I like know. It. It's like, woo. Mm -hmm. um, so what you've got some incredible, like you're the before, during, and after, right? We, you know, I, I know we, we come up with this, so many questions. So knock, knock, the, was the impact on the door or was it the other way around? Tell us in the beginning how the early part of that merger kind of came around. So it was, it was kind of mutual. Um, Bob Ruffalo, who's the CEO of Impact, is, is somebody that I always considered to be friendly competition. Yeah. Um, we had met each other at the inbound conference um, I wouldn't say we know each other, we knew each other really well, but we knew of each other. I Got think it. we both had a high regard for each other's agencies and it actually came about because of a podcast, funny enough. So <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> yeah, I have a podcast called the Inbound Success Podcast and I was starting it when I was still at Quintain and it was, I believe, April of 2017 and, and Bob was one of the first guests that I interviewed. And this was before the podcast even launched. I, I wanted to have like eight episodes in the can. And so I got him on the, on a zoom call, like we're doing now. And before we started in on the podcast interview, we were just chatting and he was like, Hey, how are things going with Quintine? And I just said, you know, I'm kind of tired. I'm kind of burnt out. I don't know if I'm going to continue doing this. I'm, I'm thinking about other options it's still early, but that's kind of where my head's at. And I'll never forget him saying, you know, you know, if you, if you decide to do something different, give me a call. And a lot of people might say something like that, but he kind of said it in a way where I knew, knew there was some substance behind it. Mm -hmm. So I filed that away in my brain and, um, I believe it was in May. So about a month later, my husband and I made the decision that we wanted to make a change. Yeah. And we were looking at all the options. We were looking at like, Hey, do we just close the agency and get jobs? Do we yeah. sell the agency? Do we, you know, what do we do? And does one and, person get a job, does one stay? Does it? Yeah. Like, yeah. So many, there are so many options. Yeah. And for us, the reason we really wanted to make a change, part of it was just, I was exhausted after 11 years. Um, right. I, I wasn't having fun anymore. Um, there were, you know, definitely financially, it, it was all, I felt like I was always just sort of in a battle to get to where I wanted to be. And, yeah. and I have two kids in college, um, you know, no so <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, and we were just at this stage of our lives where we were like, do we still want to keep fighting this battle or do we want to maybe pick an easier road? that's less stressful, maybe get paychecks from different people instead of both being in the same situation. And, um, so we were looking at all those options and I remember saying to John, my husband, you know, let me just give Bob Ruffalo a call because he said this thing and mm -hmm. I'll call him and there's either going to be something there or there isn't. And I think I called him like May 15th and literally within 30 days, the entire deal came together very, very, very quickly. Incredible. Um, and we sold essentially the half of our agency that was the inbound marketing agency to impact. Yeah. And myself and I think all but one of the employees came over and our clients came over, which was really important to me because that was, I think the biggest right thing that was making me feel a sense of angst over making a change was that I loved my team. They were so good. And I, and I love my clients and I wanted to do right by all of them mm. and not just leave them out of a job or out of an agency. And so it was yeah. the perfect solution because we, you know, we all came over to impact. It was so similar culturally uh, in yeah. terms of the services, in terms of the processes. And then, and they did not purchase the promotional product side of our business. Um, so, you know, that went a different direction, but um, it worked out really well and came together very fast. That's, that's such a quick turnaround. That's yeah. incredible. Did you, when, when Bob said yes, did you go home and talk to John and put a deal together? Did you work on the deal with Bob? Did you have some must-haves? The clients obviously was a you know, you want to take the clients, but, but personally, did you have some, did you put up a wish list or how did, how did that work? The actual mechanics? Yeah, it was really collaborative. I think mm -hmm. neither one of us, I mean, I think both of us came into it with a sense of what we were looking for. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, but we were both had open minds. There was some due diligence that needed to happen. Yeah. One reason that the deal came together so quickly is that we had an opportunity to get out of our commercial lease. Um, Brilliant. And I was like, we need to hit that timeline because I don't want to have yeah. another yeah. few years of the lease to pay off. Um, and I think the, the biggest thing for me was I did really hope that, that all of my team could come over, but I, you know, there were no guarantees. It had to make sense for impact. And so Bob talked to everyone on the team. I think there was only one person that didn't come over with us and she, she was a great designer, but very young. Right. And I think it actually was best for her to not come. I wound up helping her find a job with another HubSpot partner locally. Yeah. She, she needed to be with a team in person. Yeah. Um, as opposed to some of the other folks that came over who had more experience, I think were better set up to succeed in a remote environment. Um, and yeah. then, yeah. And then all the clients came over and it was so funny because I remember what I, I was telling the clients what was going to happen. And I had one client who had been through some M and A before yeah. and I was saying, Oh, it's going to be really smooth. We have this whole plan. And he said, everybody always thinks that, but it never is. And we did the deal. Uh -huh. We made the switch. And, I, and about three months later, he was like, that was the smoothest transition I've ever oh seen. My God. <laughs> so it was good. It worked out really well. A naysayer turning around and turning. That's, that is incredible. So in the first few months, um, we, we both were so similar with this because I, I worked for myself and then I went to work for HubSpot for a while. And, and, and that transition from I'm the boss to you're the boss um, like personally for me, I was loving it. I was like you, I was tired. I, I, I changed countries. There was a lot going on personally. I was just delighted to get in stuck into a job yeah. and, and not worry about anything else and just be good at the job. And, and I really threw myself into it. How, what was your experience like the first few months? Like, tell us about some of the things that were different that you uh, were going through. Yeah. I think in some ways it was very similar to yours. Like I was I, all I had done for 11 years was work. Right. Like I always, I, I joke, you know, it's not even a joke. My Twitter handle is work mommy work. And it's, I know. When, yeah. <laughs> when I started on Twitter, my life was get up early work until my son woke up, get him off to school work. He would come home. I would feed him and he would go to bed and then I would work. Like that was it. I had no hobbies. I had no life. I just worked a lot yeah. and I loved my work for yeah. a long time. But, um, but I promised myself that if I did make this change that I would, make some room for myself and my family and invest a little bit more in having balance. And so when I first joined impact, I spent the first six months on the sales team, which is interesting because I had never really been in a true sales role before I had done sales for my agency. Um, but I, I came on and I worked the pipeline that I brought over with me nice. and I found out I'm good at sales, which is great. Yeah. Um, but I always describe that time like being on sabbatical because <laughs> I came over and I had nobody reporting to me for the first time in 11 years. Right. I had, all I had to do was make my number and I could just sit, work my deals, hit my targets and everything was great. And, and it was, home. yes. <laughs> well, and I worked for my house. Yeah. So oh, I, that's yeah, right. yeah. Go, go down. Amazing. Yeah. So that was like this phenomenal break. And then uh, things changed a little bit. And in um, January of 2018, I took over impacts marketing team. Mm. And it's interesting what you say about like going from being the boss to not being the boss. Cause there are yeah. some aspects of that that were so, so great, but I also was really scared to be perfectly honest. And I said this to Bob when we went through this merger <laughs> yeah. that I'm so used to being, you know, the decider as they Got say, it. yeah. Book um, stops with you. Decisions yeah. stop with you. Yeah. 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 And I'm a strong personality, you know, I'm, I'm a little type A. <laughs> um, I think a lot of business owners are. And, and I remember saying to him, like, are you going to, are we going to like butt heads? Are we like, I'm going to try really hard to, to change my way of approaching things and, and get out of that headspace of being the one in charge. But I, like, I was really nervous yeah. that he and I would clash. And there was a little bit of a time, especially after I took over the marketing team, that it was hard. I'll be honest. Like we went through a total rough patch because he had directly run marketing for the agency and it's his baby. Like he's a marketer. Yeah. So to turn it over to somebody else, um, is tough. And like, I have strong opinions. He has strong opinions. You know, yeah. the great thing is we we're both really committed to like working through it. I think we have a great working relationship now and it, you know, it's been such an interesting journey to go through, but I do think if anybody's listening and they're thinking about 
like exiting their own agency and working for somebody else. That's, that is one thing I would say you have to give some thought to and be very self-aware. Like, am I going to be able to be, you know, do I need to be the chief or can I be the Indian? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a very different role and, and you have to be willing to change your mindset. Um, yeah. And that's not always easy, especially if you've been the leader for a long time. Yeah, no, it definitely isn't easy. And what I'm experiencing as well is there's just a certain unclarity as to the compelling reasons, right? So it's like things haven't been written down. So if we could just reflect on your, a little bit on your journey is, is like a certain, you were tired. A, a, yeah. a, you, not that you couldn't do it. I'm pretty sure if you took three months off, recouped and went back into it, you'd be absolutely grand. We know we're, we're strong women, but it's about where do you see yourself? Yeah. You know, what does the agency world look like? We all know it's merging. We all know it's either going the specialized high end consulting route or, and I'm not saying that just because, you know, I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm generally, if I was on my own, I'd be out there looking for someone to partner with or to merge under because it's such a vast field. So I think if someone's sitting out there today and they're listening and they're going, yeah, it's a bit of a fight. Um, not particularly happy. I'd love to just be doing this all day long, not 15 things. Yeah. Kind of half well. I'd love to be doing one or two things really well. Thinking about their future, a compelling event as well, like your lease, huge, you know. Um, there's, uh, there's other things that are, anything else there when you're, if, you're, if anyone's out there, or have you spoken to people recently that are, hmm, I don't know, what will I do? Yeah, I had a lot of those those conversations and what you said is so spot on. So when, when we were talking about, when John and I were talking about what do we do? Yeah. Um, one of the conversations we had was that I was observing, particularly in the HubSpot partner world, the inbound marketing agency world, that a lot of the do marketing for me services that many of the earliest partner agencies built their businesses on were getting very commodified. Yes. Um, and so price, there was a ton of price pressure, a ton of competition. I didn't want to run an agency that was competing on price. Yeah. So I, I realized I either need to really change, um, the, the focus of my agency. And at the time we were already moving in the direction of becoming like more of a cybersecurity marketing agency because yeah. we were close to Fort Meade, uh, in Maryland, there were a lot of cyber startups. Um, and I was like, if we're going to keep doing this, we're going to just go really niche and focus on this one industry or you know, I need to shrink the size of the agency, just do some niche work and maybe I can be profitable with far yeah. fewer people. But like the, the model I had wasn't working. We were too, trying to be too many things to too many people. Yeah. And, and at the time I, I believed just as it sounds like you do, that there was a big wave of consolidation coming yeah. and it hadn't really started yet. And, and I remember saying to my husband, this is our chance to be one of the first. And, and it's important because if we're going to merge or be acquired or whatever, I want to, I want to have my pick of agencies. Like I want, I don't want to just merge with anybody. It has yeah. to be the right agency. And that was why I was so thrilled that things work out with impact because Bob was the only person I thought to call at the time. And I really, I really had hoped that it would work and, you know, impact can't merge with slash acquire every agency. So yeah. I, I was like, we're going to get in and we're going to be the first and take yeah. that opportunity while we have it. So, yeah. And I think the other thing as well, you knew that if <laughs> you knew as well, if you were like dilly dallying and then yeah. he went off with someone else, not that he yeah. wouldn't acquire yeah. you. I think you would have been kicking yourself. You would have been ugh, like, you know, and, and yeah. it's well to, if you're on the fence, kind of jump in. You've just, the most wonderful opportunity there with impact. I think that's incredible. And that's what I see for other people as well. It's like, when I look at you and all that you're doing, and I'd love you to share the direction because I think we're all trying to figure out around our heads that impact is doing media. They're doing, how, how's that working? And I'd love to hear more about, it's, I feel looking at you and, and talking to you when I met you at a partner day a few, a, a few months ago, you've had a new lease of life, right? And, and you've got this mini business inside this business that you are running with and going with. So tell us what's up with impact and on your direction. Yeah, it's, it's really been fun and challenging. Um, I, when we decided to, um, exit Quintain, I really did not want to go work for another inbound marketing agency. 
you know, that's what was kind of burning me out. And I just did not want to do more of the same. So this really was the only agency I could have gone to because Bob's vision when I first met with him was that what has historically been an agency impact that happens to publish a lot. Yes. Um, which they have, they've always had, they, now we have always had a very aggressive content engine yes. um, and, and shift that business model from the agency that happens to publish a lot to a publisher that happens to have an agency inside of it. And he had yes. really been inspired by Joe Polizzi's writings in Content Inc. and Killing Marketing. Um, so I immediately went out and read the books and I thought, this is cool. This is, this is not more of the same. This is an opportunity for me to come in and build a totally different type of business. Um, and what excites me is having a new challenge to sink my teeth into. So it's been a ton of fun for the last year. You know, we've undergone dramatic changes. If anybody has followed Impact as an Agency, then they have noticed, for example, our website has gone from looking like a, your typical agency website to now we look a lot more like an Inc. or a Forbes. Correct. What have you. Um, yeah. And there are more changes coming. Yeah, um, I can imagine. But it's fun. Like, yeah, I spend a lot of time um, really reading up on the publishing industry. You know, we are what would be considered to be a niche brand publisher. We're not, we are not an anchor of Forbes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are a lot of media companies that are struggling, but niche brand publishers by and large are doing well and are profitable. And the whole idea for us is, is twofold. One is that we have a very large audience. We've always had a lot of traffic and leads. Yeah but we can't work with everybody uh, as an agency. And so part of it is how do we create a business that delivers value to everyone in our audience, regardless of whether they can hire us as an agency. And I think the media company offering does that. We have, yeah. you know, we have a Facebook community, Impact Elite, which is about 5,000 people, That's marketers, right. yeah. there's no cost to join, um, tons of valuable discussions there. We have our conference, Impact Live. Again, you know, it's, it's not a super expensive conference, but it's, it's about, giving our audience access to the best marketing thought leaders and, and, you know, other programs are, are coming. So part of it was how do we serve the whole audience? But then the other part is we're building a business that has a very different revenue model. We'll always have the agency, hmm. which is, you know, agency owners out there know what that revenue model is, but the publisher side of the business, like any publisher is about monetizing content as a product and monetizing the audience. So selling sponsorships, entering into different partnerships, um, doing sponsor content, uh, you know, working with, we work with a lot of MarTech companies for our events, et cetera. And yeah. so that's really what I'm charged with is building an entirely different revenue stream that is about monetizing content as a product and monetizing the audience. And, and that, if done well, will have dramatically higher margins than the agency business. Yeah. So I, I think that, and the impact, um, the impact life, it, you know, mm -hmm. like actually running an event like that. Now agencies are out sitting out there listening and I know I can hear them. I can hear them before they're even yeah. doing They're going, well, I'm not as big as impact. I don't have that much traffic. It's not about that. You can have your private Facebook group for your agency. Yeah. You can run your breakfast seminars for the price of a donut, a bag of donuts and, and a cup of coffee, which are working extremely well. You don't have to be as big as you guys, but thinking alternatively like the way you are, it, it, it is accessible to everyone. So don't be sitting there, you guys rolling your eyes out there. <laughs> yeah, especially if you're in a real niche, like mm. we are not niche, we're, we're yeah, not niche. You're you know, we, are, we are very much like, we work with lots of different types of companies and lots of different types of industries. But if somebody is listening and they wanted to do something similar, maybe on a smaller scale, you know, I put my Quintain hat back on. And if I was building this cybersecurity marketing company, you don't need to be as big as Impact to build that kind of a brand publisher. You could really you know, double down on publishing about cybersecurity marketing, having a little yes. cybersecurity marketing event, building a group, you know, it doesn't have to be large. To be exactly. Public. Yeah. I think that's what I want. I hear a lot of people go, oh, Impact, they have this and they're big and they're that. It's like, no, they're doing stuff that is completely replicable. Replicable. can't say that word. <laughs> um, <laughs> Ability to copy <laughs> um, in that sense. Now, something I, I don't know how much detail you want to go into, but because you're working at Impact, because you have a team, because it's, you're not pressured with all the other things, there's something else, a side project you're working on. Would you like to share a little bit about that or would you like to leave that very elusive? <laughs> oh, well, I, you know, I think my passion that, that has developed from 
you know, my experience that I had as a business owner. Um, and I, it's funny because I had had other little businesses throughout my history. So Quintain was one of probably four right. different entrepreneurial ventures. Um, the big thing that I took away from that was that entrepreneurs are terrible about being honest about their failures. And it's, it's really awful that we're not able to talk about it more. And I think that's part of why they can feel very isolated and take on a tremendous amount of stress. When, when you're able to peel back the onion and get people to start talking, it's, you realize you're not alone, that all companies are having these challenges. You know, like they're one of the worst days of my life was the, the, I think first time I ever missed payroll. It was horrible. Oh. I cried in my office. Oh. It was just yeah. terrible. Yeah. And horrible experience. Yeah. So my passion is about, is about getting entrepreneurs to be more open about their failures, both large and small. I I'm, I'm hoping to write a book on that. Um, awesome. and to, build more of a community of entrepreneurs that are willing to share those stories and support each other as they go through those trials and tribulations. A hundred percent. I swear sometimes we're like sisters. That was me towards the end. I was closing the agency last year. I was going through the final stages of closing and uh, get focused. It just hadn't worked out the way I wanted to. And that's another series of podcasts on all yeah. of that. But I was in the middle of finishing my book and yeah. it was, I was very close to turning around and going, that's that project. I'm not going to finish that book until it was brought to my attention by one of my friends going, well, if you write that book and you tell people, this is why you've written the book so that other people, you can help other people. And it is okay to fail and it yeah. is okay to do things. But I a hundred percent agree We're we're absolutely known for holding it all in, being afraid. And, and sometimes it's just difficult to talk to your friends, especially when they all have jobs because they all look at you going, We'll just get a job, you know, like their right. answer is not what you need to hear. Um, so that is fantastic. And anything we can all do to support you on that, we'd love to hear it because uh, there's a lot of us out there would love to talk about it. And there's a lot more people. So if you're listening to this, guys and gals, <laughs> share yeah. stories with us. We want to hear it because a failure is just a failure and you can help other people with those mistakes. So yeah, tweet me, tweet me at work, mommy work. If you want to talk about your failures, because I want to surface those stories in the book. Exceptional. That's so good. So going through that difficult time, I've, I've, I've talked about this a few times. I keep attracting agency couples. Like it, I, there's not millions of you, but oh, gee, they're, they're coming thick and fast. And I love it because I find it fascinating. During those difficult times, is there any tips that yourself and John worked on in your relationship and you're working together, whether it was good or tough when you're in the business? Um, Remington was on recently. He talks about his work life balance with his wife. Was there any tips that you worked on together that we could share with other agency couples? Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I always tell people that my proudest accomplishment in life is that I'm still married after 11 years of owning a business with my husband. Um, it's hard when things are good. They're so good because you're both in it. And when things are yeah. bad, they're just like the worst of the worst because you're both in it. Yeah. Um, you don't have a safety net. And so for us, um, I think there were a couple things that made it, made it work. One, one was not having much overlap. So right. he ran the promotional product side of the business. I ran the agency side. Brilliant. Um, when we did overlap, we would have arguments. <laughs> um, <laughs> and not only not overlapping in terms of your responsibilities to the extent possible, but like we literally put our offices at the opposite ends of the, the suite that we were in so that right. we physically had as much distance. Because you go home and you're with that person all the time. I know, right? Yeah. So like we were, you know, Different as far room. away as we could be. Um, and then, and then, you know, it sounds trite, but honestly, just, you have to be so committed to really honest communication, radical candor. Like when things are frustrating, you have to talk about it. That's any marriage, mm -hmm. but it's even more important when you own a business together because you cannot let these things fester and there's a lot of stress. So if you're not able to communicate well, it, then joint business ownership is not something that you should do. <laughs> great <laughs> great advice that is that is yeah. spot on um today though you're working from home most of the time and then occasionally you're in the impact office today is there a special occasion or is there just something on just uh i, I so i am on the leadership team at impact there's i think maybe 10 of us on the on that team uh, uh we meet monthly and I would say once every quarter, roughly, we try to do it all in person because a couple of us are remote. So I came up really because we had a new person join our leadership team and we wanted to just all be here together. 
Super. Um, it's great. It's such an easy trip up and, and I love coming into the office and yeah. being here occasionally just to kind of soak in wh what the feeling is here. It's very different than working remotely. Yeah, it is. But working remotely, um, one of the tips that I asked, I always ask somebody if they've got a secret tip on how to stay energetic and vibrant and things. It is easy. I'm the same. Most times I've no commute. I've lost my commute. And in that, in that I've lost my podcast time sometimes. I do, I do miss my, my commutes when I had them. Um, so it is easy for us people to go, well, my first call's at eight. So, but you, like me, love the early rise. T tell me more about those habits you formed about getting up early. Yeah, and I didn't always do that. But as I mentioned earlier, when I, when I left Quintain, I was committed to finding better balance in my life. And so I have made myself become an early morning person. I get up at 545 um, with my husband. I've now dragged him to do this with me. We go to the gym pretty much every weekday morning from six to seven, which is right before our son wakes up. So our youngest is um, 12 and he has to get up at seven for school. So we get an hour of working out in, we come home, you know, we get him off to school and then my husband goes to his job, which is out of the house. I go up to my office and I really treat it like I'm going to work. Like I yeah. go up to my office and I'm in there until roughly lunchtime and, you know, come out for lunch, go back in. Um, yeah. And that has worked really well. I, the other thing that's so great is just you know, being on Zoom like we are uh, now. I, I know. I joke that my Look earbuds are going to grow attached to me because I spend so much time on video, but I don't honestly feel remote most of the time because I spend all day on video with people. And the, the connection is incredible. I'm in the west of Ireland right now. I'm in a yeah. country seaside town <laughs> and we could be across a table from each other. It is yeah, it's great. It's incredible, isn't it? It's, it, it is absolutely incredible. Um, that's so cool. So um, look at, we've had, oh my God, we've had such a big chat and God, if, you, if we were let to it, if there was no limits on podcasts, yeah. we'd be here all day. We've loads to talk about. But yes. today we'd love to wrap this up, Kathleen, and I'd love to say thank you so much. But one last tip, I, I, I love this part. I just think about today because I used to work in HubSpot and today there's a cam and he's sending a payment link to a brand new agency who is about to come into the inbound world the, you know there, there could be a traditional agency transitioning but I think within that framework or they could be a husband and wife team sitting across the table thinking about starting their business what advice would you have for those people that uh, any tips that we could give them I think the biggest thing is really take a little bit of time, take a step back and define what success is going to look like for you. I, I wish I had done this earlier, but at some point, John and I sat down and did a, a 10 year vision for if we look back in 10 years and say, we, we made it, we did what we wanted. What does that look like? But then also have a bar for, for what the low end is like, right. what triggers need to happen for you to say, this isn't working and we're going to exit. I didn't have that. And so I think I let things with Quintain go on longer than I might otherwise have. And I, I feel like have those conversations before things get stressful. Like when you're just in the planning stages, when things are good, it's, it's kind of like a business prenup. Like what yeah. is the condition for exit and what is the condition for success? Define that before you have the pressure on you. That's fantastic. It's like a barometer. It's like the temperature check. I think we've many times have found ourselves like the lobster in the pot going, what yeah. the hell happened here? Yes, <laughs> because exactly. one was checking the temperature as we went along. And that's all about monthly meetings, looking at your numbers um, and, and putting some triggers in place for the low end, but also the high end. I, I mean, this is what I, I, I find fascinating in the agency world. It is your business. You can be whatever you want to be in that business. If you just want to come in one day a week, yeah. prom do a presentation to the team. If you want to be sailing four days a week, if you don't want to come in, you just want the revenue. The business is a very unusual business. And most businesses, are, a coffee shop is the same. There's coffee owners who don't darken the door. So decide yeah. what you want to do. Just because you were in marketing and just because you used to build websites doesn't mean you have to do that. If you have a good business with great people, you can be whatever you want. You can just go to the partner days and say you have an agency. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. That sounds like a great plan. Right? How much fun would that be? But it's, the point is the systems and, and, and let the right people in the right place do the job that perhaps you don't want to do. Um, but don't be dragging everyone down with you. But um, look, Kathleen, this has been incredible. Um, goodness knows when I'll see you again. It might hopefully be an inbound, but def definitely be inbound, if not before then. 
you never know with me. I'm always popping up in all these places. But have oh, you had any European trips planned? I was going to say, maybe with any luck, I'll make it to Ireland. I have, I'm half Irish and I've never been. So. Oh, Kathleen, would you get your act together? For God's sake, get on I that. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm, I'm a slattery. Slattery, as they That's say. That's right, you are slattery. That's right. I mean, you couldn't get more Irish than that. Well, thank you so much for your time today and your insights. That was another episode with me, with Kathleen Booth from Impact. Thank you, Kathleen. Thanks for having me. Not at all. See you all later. <laughs>